So to me, that kind of music is one of the tools I use. It's the music I listen to when I'm trying to meditate and keep getting distracted by, you know, squirrel or whatever, some other deep and important subject that happens. What brings me back is sometimes the music, sometimes what somebody else says, sometimes just, you know, I just get that flash of, it's all still here. And that's when I start having the wonderful experience of oneness. If you think about it, all the tools we use, every time we go to a practitioner, every time we go to prayer, every time we use an affirmation, what we're doing is reaffirming, re remembering our oneness with the whole. The work we do here, whether it's outreach or the, food, the incredible food we get every week, all of that is reminding us that we are one with each other, as well as one with the divine being that lives in each and every one of us. And if we could just stay in that space, can you imagine? Can you imagine what would happen? Hmm. He's right. You don't have to imagine because it's already happening. It's already happening. This morning I got a, um, a text and I had to go to my tools because first thing in the morning on a Sunday you don't want any texts. I'm like, oh God, who canceled? Oh my God, Jackson's sick and he's not coming in. It's, I quit. I'm staying in bed. But what I got was a text from Eileen Sherrill, who was a longtime member, saying that she had replaced the little uh, cover on Jackson's piano. Because it's so important to her to be the face of beauty and to make sure that this building reflects it. Isn't that sweet? She just kind of snuck in here and then asked me to pray for the Rams. <laughs> I told her I loved her, but I need to be able to go home again at some point, so me and the Brady Bunch. And then I admitted I really just root for the football because then I get every single point. <laughs> we have so many opportunities to get divisive in our society, don't we? Whether it's Super Bowl and which is the best ad or who is the best team and who cheats the most. I know. I used to pick my favorite team based on who had the least amount of white in their uniform. Because what idiot puts themselves in white and then goes ro and rolls around on the grass and in the mud? See, if women were in charge of this, no, wait a minute, that's old thinking. We could use this experience to come together, couldn't we? It doesn't have to be all about yelling and screaming at the TV or the person who's sitting next to you and rooting for the wrong team or voted for the wrong person, or the wrong side of an issue. Wrong being defined by whether or not you agree with me, which is, of course, a measure of intelligence, <laughs> right? I know we joke about it, but we kind of think that way sometimes, don't we? If you're thinking differently than I do, there must be something wrong with you, whoever gave you that fake news, whoever brought you up wrong. I'm gonna go talk to your mama. We do have these, these internal, sometimes ins unspoken ideas about the right way to do things. And that's why it's so important that we light these candles every Sunday. To remember that it's not the truth trademarked by religious science. We don't own God, believe it or not. We don't have the one true path here. We have a really good path. We have a set of very nice tools that people can try on and see how they work in their lives. We have the opportunity to come practice using those tools within a safe environment because what we have promised one another as we became members here is that we honor each other's paths and wherever we are on the path on any particular day. Many of you have already heard me say that it's important to show up here whether you feel like Mother Teresa or Mommy Dearest.
it's important to be here and do your practice no matter how it feels. As I was prepping for this particular talk, a lot of it is about, you know, this is um, a time in American history where our division is really kind of up in our face. Yeah? Anyone have neighbors you simply cannot talk to about certain things? Whether it's money, religion, or politics is what I was raised with, is don't ever bring that up at the table. And what I'm going to ask us to remember is that there is an underlying oneness. That there's a soul conversation and all of us, including the people you think have it wrong, all of us came here for such a time as this in which that could be brought up and healed. Nothing comes up in our lives except that it is brought up to be healed. And our theme this month is seeking the common good. Now, common good is something that we might have conversation around about just what is the common good? Is it having access to medical marijuana or not using drugs? Okay, some of you are looking at me like, Kathleen, where are you going? <laughs> I am not, you guys know I'm still learning to cook. I don't suggest any particular herb anywhere. However, there are conversations going on about that. There's conversations about, we just sang that we believe all life is sacred. What does that mean? That has different meanings to different people, whether we're talking about abortion issues or whether we're talking about uh, the right to a life of dignity or we're talking about euthanasia. Did anyone else get really confused about what euthanasia was back in school? When I was in the seventh grade, I was told we were supposed to debate euthanasia. And I'm like, what, they live there. What's to debate? <laughs> See, we're allowed to have these conversations and these even debates about what it all means. And I would suggest to you that so long as we don't take ourselves too seriously, so long as we take the principle seriously but not ourselves, we're going to find common ground. We will rise to the common good. Because it's not about what I want. It's about what we collectively decide. And there is a wisdom that happens when the group gets together. Yesterday, a dozen people came together to talk about, to have one of our community conversations and talk about what does this place want to be. Last year was a wonderful year for us. We gained land, we gained a nice bequest. We gained a lot of stuff and I, feel strongly about making sure we take care of that stuff consciously. And so one person was, was there, has been around for quite some time, and was able to bring up what the thinking was when this building was built, and how important it was that, to the members at the time that we never have a mortgage. Okay, that's important, yes? It's part of our history, it's part of our institutional memory. Other people wanted to bring up issues like how do we become a little bit more welcoming to people who don't walk as well as I do when I'm wearing flats? What if we made it a little easier to get physically in the doors, those double doors? It never occurred to me that those are difficult. And they are. They're all, I only notice they're difficult when I'm trying to carry something at the same time. So we had a great conversation and I give great thanks to the people who did show up. If you had to miss it, then I would like you to know that we're pro I'm aiming for one every other month this year. A community conversation every other month. Um, so that everybody has a chance to express their wisdom. Even if you think you don't have any, even if you don't feel at all attached to what happens here, it might do you good to show up and just listen? <clears throat> it's possible that somebody's going to throw out an idea that will change your life. That will be what you want to get involved in, yes? Sometimes it's easy to forget that other people see things differently. Anyone here ever looked around and seen their own blind spot? 
Okay, it's more accurate to say we saw the evidence of who we ticked off because we weren't aware of our blind spot, yes? The problem with these assumptions that we don't talk about is that you only find out about them after you have run smack face first into them and you're trying to figure out what hits you. As a matter of fact, with, with, uh, with gratitude to Reverend Mary Jo Hono, Honiotes, I always mess up her last name. I have always, I don't always. Um, she was sitting with someone named Tim Wise. Has anyone seen his talks online? He worked for the Obama administration and his first job was getting people to realize that racism still exists in this country. You laugh, but there was a survey taken a few years ago. 12% of white Americans surveyed thought there was still a chance that Elvis Presley was alive. 6% of white Americans surveyed said that yes, they thought there was racial inequality happening in this country. If it doesn't touch you, how are you supposed to know about it? If it's not part of your life, if you're not walking in that skin, how are you supposed to really get the full picture of what's going on? Being unaware does not make you bad. Ignorance is a wonderful disease because it can be healed with information. We can choose to get educated about what our brothers and sisters within the Christ consciousness, what the other Buddhas on this planet are experiencing here and now. And we can join them to the degree that we are willing to look into their eyes and see our highest self. It might make you feel a little better to know that NBC put out another uh, survey in May of 2018 saying that 68% of Americans say racism is still a problem, a major problem. It was disheartening to me to see that 30% it's, that say it still exists but it isn't a major problem. I don't know if they're talking about a major problem as opposed to global warming. It doesn't matter if we're all unequal, if we're all also underwater. Or, you know, what, it's, it's not a major problem. I don't know what that means. But it occurs to me that there are places in my life where I simply don't hear myself the way someone who is not cisgendered someone who is not straight, someone who is not white, someone who did not have access to education, might hear things. Once upon a time, I was at Asilomar at our summer conference and we were in the dining hall. Now, if you've ever been there, it, it makes Sibley Hall positively easy to hear other conversations in. It, there's this little roar going on all the time. And it's easy to hear bits and pieces of other people's stories. I was counseling somebody, I was mentoring somebody about what it's like to candidate for a pulpit, what it's like to go apply for a pulpit and the things you need to be aware of and some of the stuff you might wanna do. And I spoke to her about be who you really are as much as you can be, because this that's is their chance to know the real you. You'd think that would be obvious, right? But so many of us get into a job interview and we try and uh, like fake it. Like somehow I'm better than, than I think I am. I'm going to play by what I think you want of me, by the rules I've been told are the right way to do things. <sighs> when what they really need is the real you what you consider your, your faults and everything. So I made a point of saying that and then pointed out that as somebody coming from a very blue state, coming into what I had been told was a conservative bastion and I had to be careful. Did you guys know that you're all scary? <laughs> hey, you hired me. <laughs> I made a point of talking about how I feel about homophobia, how I feel about seeing the Christ in people who are different, 
And I made it really clear, as a matter of fact, at the time, one of the board members at the time came out and said, wow, you really expect us to do the work. And I'm like, yeah, I do. Because that's the only way this works. Well, somebody overheard me. And from what they overheard, suddenly, by that night, it got to Dr. Ken Gordon that I had an anti-lesbian hiring policy. And so I had a lovely conversation that day with our ethics department, in which I eventually explained that my only anti-gay policy regards dating. Let that nickel drop. Yes, I made that mistake a couple times. Of course we don't have an anti-gay policy here. Don't be redonkulous. But for some people, that's a real thing. For some people, that's a very current thing. And as I was standing there having my very odd conversation with this poor man from ethics, um, I looked at him and said, do I think there's still homophobia in the congregation? Of course I do. Do I think there's still racism? Of course I do. You find me a congregation where it doesn't exist. Find me one. And this beautiful black minister walked past me and said, mm, girl, preach. <laughs> or words to that effect. I don't do the voice right. <laughs> the truth is we all still have blind spots and that's okay. What I experience is that people who are different from me just want to be seen. Same as me, yes? People who are different from me want to be appreciated for who and what they really are as a person, yes? So who here grew up eating peanut butter and jelly? Say thank you, George Washington Carver, for giving us the peanut butter. What about, where'd it go? I love this list. Who uses caller ID so that they don't answer when it's a... Uh, uh, somebody trying to sell you something or a robocall. Who here uses caller ID? That was created by a black woman named Dr. Shirley ja Jackson. Who here likes having lights? Carbon filaments created by Louis Latimer. Who also, we can love him very, very much, this beautiful black man, for creating air conditioning. Anyone ever been to Phoenix? <laughs> That would not work without him. Who here has a loved one who's used a pacemaker? Clyde Neville, yeah. Otis Boykin, that the creator of pacemakers and the early IBM computers, is a black man. Okay, who, this one I don't know if I want to thank Mr. Lonnie G. Johnson or not, but he created the super soaker, which if you're trying to train your cat and you've just had it, works very well. He also happened to work for NASA uh, on the Galileo Jupiter probe and the Mars Observer project. Um, those of us who love those cat videos, yes? Online animation and a, something called the Shockwave program. Lisa Gelobter, my apologies for messing up her last name. Another black woman. And finally, who's excited to get a traffic light out there so that we're not practicing our best prayer as we try and drive in through our driveway. You can say thank you to Garrett Morgan, who is another black inventor. The, this happens to be Black History Month, which made coming up with that list very easy. Thank you for whoever, whoever came up with black history and the internet. <laughs> These are people who I know I never learned that Thomas Edison had help was working with a black man while creating the light bulb. Did anyone learn that in grade school? Okay, so we have some blind spots. It doesn't make us bad, it makes us human. And it means that we have more growing to do. We could, if we were willing to, experience more good in the world. Oh no, not that. Is anyone here just fed up with how much good there is? They're just done. They needed to stop. Okay, me neither. When we are willing to claim even those parts of us that maybe we would prefer nobody know about, that are a little embarrassing, but the best we could do at the time, when we're willing to claim and acknowledge those parts of us, we become better as people 
as a community and as a nation. But we have to be willing to do that without the shame and without the blame game. This is what happened. It is what happened. We did the best we could at the time. This is what we choose to do now. And that, it doesn't matter whether you're talking racism or homophobia or anti-peanut butter people. I've got peanut butter on the brain now. Um, if you're talking about your best choices around your finances or your dating life, if you're talking about your best attempts to be conscious in your early days. When, in my early days of spiritual seeking, I was a born-again Christian. And I became that obnoxious born-again Christian. You know, that one that you pray he doesn't show up at your house? It only lasted a week or so. I got over it fast because I, I just couldn't do it with a straight face. What we want is to allow all of the good possible available in the world to exist within our sphere of influence. In our affirmation, we say that the good we seek for ourselves is what, is what we desire for all, yeah, and you know, I, we could even say all beings everywhere. If we don't absolutely want it for everybody else, it ceases to be available for us because we have created within our own mental universe a place where God is not. And if you create it, you get to experience it. Yes? Does that make sense? And so in this moment, as we experience a greater understanding of our oneness, I would ask you to think about the things that you have denied yourself. Is there something you just haven't forgiven yourself for? Is there some good you think God can't get you that is unreasonable to ask for? For the love of God, stop being reasonable. And I mean that for the love of God. Is there something, just to push this a little further, that maybe you've been denying to other people who are unlike you, that you think have not earned this particular type of good, and so you're not willing for them to have it? If we had to earn the love of God, we'd never get there. And it would not be love. Love you have to earn is not love. It's a contract. Anyone ever been in that contract and then found out there was something better? True love, divine love, cannot be earned, and we don't need to ever. That's the meaning of grace. So this good that we seek for ourselves, first of all, we have to be willing to accept more good in your, our lives, and then we have to be willing for everybody to have it. That's the next step. And so my invitation to you is to accept more good in your life this week. And as that good comes to you, look at it in the eye and say, that's for everyone. Reverend Dr. Kathy Ann Lewis used to look at good out in the world and to train herself to accept more good, she would look at it and say, that's for me. I'm asking you to flip that. She wasn't trying to take anything away from anyone. She was just trying to accept it for herself. That which you have already accepted for yourself, I invite you to accept on behalf of all beings everywhere. Are we willing to run that experiment? Could you imagine if peace broke out this week? Oh my God. So having said all of that, we will use the tool, one of the tools that I like best which is the choice to consciously move into that oneness that we call prayer. I always pray from down here to remind all of us that that oneness exists. It's not special just because it comes from, what, two feet further higher in the world. <sighs> and so close your eyes with me and go within to where the true power is to that experience of God, to those eyes that actually have seen. And remember with me that we are one. 
We are one heart, one mind, one spirit in action, one life. And it is a powerful life. It is a perfect life. It is a life of abundance and joy and real love and grace. And as we are one together, we are one with the all. We are part of that one mind and so is everyone. And so the good that we now are claiming and recognizing in our own lives, this good, this being, not just any particular toy, but the beingness of good itself, this is available to all of us because we are one. It is this good that is the healing we thought we had to earn, the prosperity we th might have thought was out of reach. It is here, it is now, it is us, and it is ours. Whether it's physical, financial, or emotional healing, it is all the same revelation of the glory of our souls the glory of the divine itself. And for being that glory, I give thanks. I'm grateful that spirit is what it has always been and it what, what it continues to be, how it continues to reveal itself in all of our lives right now. That there is nothing for us to do except acknowledge it and let spirit get on with it. Having claimed our good, I just let it go and let it be. And so it is.